These two books weren't really meant to be published at the same time, but um, the, when I when I was editing this book this past fall, getting it ready for publication, I had to check quotes that came from this book because I quoted, of course, the fictional book that I was writing for 13 Ford, right? And so I realized, wait a minute, this book should be published at the same time. I've had it for 30 years after I wrote it for her. So, uh, essentially, this book is the mother of this book. Uh, because I wrote, this book tells about writing uh, Robert Kaye hired me in, in 1987 uh, on a fundraising project for a new performing arts center. And uh, a big surprise was in store for me. That was Gertrude C. Ford. Uh, you know the subtitle here, if you've noticed it, uh, an eccentric patron with a royal obsession. Uh, an eccentric patron's royal obsession. She truly and, and, and thoroughly and uh, totally believed that she was the reincarnation of Queen Elizabeth I. And I hope you will notice, as I begin to read to you today, that one of the main themes here is that connection between her and Queen Elizabeth I, because I couldn't help basing my characterization of Queen Elizabeth I on Gertrude Ford. <laughs> and it, it worked because she was so quintessentially Queen Elizabeth. And you'll hear that in her... I'm getting ready to read you uh, two sessions that she and I had. The first session when I met her, and the second session when I read to her the first chapter. Uh, Jane Stanley, you know, you, you all know Jane Stanley, uh, Neil White's mother, uh, was the university liaison for Robert Kayette. She worked in his office, and she introduced me. She was down in Jackson, and. Mrs. Ford lived on Lakeland Avenue in the Lakeland subdivision. And uh, she gave me a tour of her house, which included, get this, she had a, what I call a treasure room. It was a closet, a clothes closet that had nothing but mink coats of every hue, probably seven or eight of them, and uh, her jewelry. And she, she pulled out a bag of diamonds that had about a hundred stones in it, uncut. I mean, they were cut diamonds. None of them less than two or three carats. So you're looking at maybe $500,000 worth in 1987. And I, and I didn't ask her, what do you do with this? But she <laughs> perceived that I was thinking that question. She said, I like to run my hands through. <laughs> world. Now that's Queen Elizabeth. Now, I thought of that as Queen Elizabeth's uh, jewel, jewel. Uh, what do you call it? The uh, royal crown. Uh, crown, crown, yeah, jewels. crown jewels. That was the crown jewel. I was looking at the crown jewels of Queen Elizabeth. <coughs> uh, now, when uh, when I met her there at her house, Jane gave me to know by winks and nods that I was not to take this sport seriously. <laughs> um, and she said, this morning, oh, she had, after she met me, she went and changed clothes. She was wearing a nightgown when I came in. <laughs> and uh, smoked a cigarette and had a bourbon and coke. <laughs> and, uh, it was maybe 9 o'clock in the morning or something, 11 o'clock in the morning. And uh, Jane said, after uh, she left the room, this boy left the room, she said, Jane said, whispers over her shoulder, she thinks she looked like Edward De Beer, and she's prepared to fall in love with you. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was rough. <laughs> and uh, so, I do want to start out with the um, epigraph by William Baldwin. <clears throat> and I chose this on purpose. If I had not existed, someone else would have written me, Hem written me, Hemingway, Dostoevsky, all of us. Someone else would have created him. Proof of that is that there are about three candidates for the authorship of Shakespeare's plays. But what is important is Hamlet and A Midsummer Night's Dream, not who wrote them, but that somebody did. 
the artist is of no importance. And he, he, this is an interview by Gene Stein for the Paris Review. It's a very famous quote by him. But if you think about it, we are lucky that we have the plays of Shakespeare and, and the first folio was a miracle that they were able to put those, all those together, all those plays in, man, in holograph, in manuscript, you know. And uh, that, and I agree with Wagner, that's what's important, is that we do have the works. And of course, he was thinking about it as an artist who wanted his work to endure forever, and he didn't care if people remembered him. He didn't need fame. But if you're wondering what the, uh, the uh, theory of, of, of the authorship for Edward de Beer is, uh, he, he wanted to be a kingmaker. Unfortunately, if he was Shakespeare and if he wrote the, the, the sonnets, he wanted to, the, the queen, he wanted to sh embarrass the queen and shame her into acknowledging their son, their biological son, Henry Reesley who is the third Earl of Southampton and fear you with the science. Uh, and she, uh, uh, what, what resulted was she forbade him, they forbade him from publishing under the name, under the pseudonym Shakespeare, because she didn't want him to have any connection with Shakespeare's science, having written these science that were to her treasonous, because she was saying, uh, we would not uh, acknowledge her tutor heir. Okay, here, here's my, here's my first session, my first meeting with, with Mrs. Ford. Mrs. F, and I call her Mrs. F throughout the book. F, Mrs. F slumps on the sofa. Being short of breath makes her furious. She had emphysema from smoking. With faltering hands, she indicates the clippings on the coffee table, stabbing them with a stiff index finger. She makes a da-da-da-da sound until I ask, you read my reviews? She nods, silently raging. In a flash of irony, I realize that these generous reviews may, in the end, damn me. She heaves air into her lungs. Good reviews don't care, guarantee a best, bestseller. I want you to make our book, our book, as lascivious as it can be. They sent chills down the end. <laughs> Make Shakespeare a stud? I was expecting different marching orders. Take the hill, get no quarter, drown the prima donnas in their own blood. A hundred and fifty miles away, my wife Dean, who knows about the perils of a literary career, is waiting to hear about my first meeting with my patron. When I get home, I'll ask Dean about the, the degrees of lasciviousness. <laughs> we, that is, Mrs. F and I. Start quietly and build up for Kyle and sex from the get-go. If Dean doesn't know, she'll have an informed opinion. There's no shame, I remind myself, in writing something unpublishable. Fitzgerald and Faulkner hacked out Hollywood scripts that were never made into movies. Then I think to myself in italics, your job is to hotwire a plot without being electrocuted. <laughs> When Mrs. F. invoked her husband's nicotine presence during our house tour, meeting his cigars, the smell of his cigars and his game room, and gave me a peek at her diamonds, she was saying, in effect, my husband is dead, I'm Elizabeth Rex, you're able to read it, let's get it on. <laughs> she is all the heat this cold house needs, a built-in furnace, a hottie, that refuses to yield to age, a pink fortress on a blue chip mountain. Was Edward de Vere really Shakespeare? I sincerely doubt it, but if in the weeks and months to come, de Vere comes creaking and clanking to life on my typewriter, no one will be happier than I. He and I are soon to become brothers in the bond, twin brothers, twin sons of Frankenstein. <laughs> he was a virgin. Her eyes are like rapier points. Excuse me? Edward Devere, who'd you think? I struggle to catch her drift. I mean, she says, he was a virgin when, El when Elizabeth seduced him. She seduced him and not the other way around. She's the queen. He lives to satisfy her. <laughs> These two some chills. 
we're all virgins in the early going, but young Shakespeare, a.k.a. Edward de Vere, a virgin? Sex is the jet fuel of all creative endeavor. Think Mozart, Byron, Warhol, Elvis. Shakespeare had balls and wrote with compassion. compassion. What girl could keep her hands off him? Life was short. Maidens rolling in the hay at 12. 14 was pushing it. The skeptic in me can't keep from asking, so you think he'd still be a virgin after attending Oxford, Cambridge, and Grady's Inn? Thwarted, obstructed, constricted by my lack of understanding, she writhes in agony. <laughs> Heaves to get a breath and says, he had to be careful of his seed. <laughs> when an earl descended from the Plantagenets, waste sperm on the milk money, you know he was keeping himself pure for a woman of equal stature. See, this is me trying to rationalize and understand. <laughs> A baroness, at least. Meanwhile, the teenage settler read poetry, practiced swordsmanship, and falconry invited his sign. That's why he was still a virgin, okay? She bites into an Oreo. She, all she ate, her total diet, as far as I could tell, was Oreo, Oreos and uh, bourbon and coke. <laughs> Dark eyes burning into me, waiting. Sometimes the waiting can be long, shadows grow deep. Rip Van Winkle knew the feeling. Nobody dances the old dance like a southern belle. Where did Oxford and Elizabeth first do the deed? She rummages, meaning Mrs. F, through a Hollinshed's chronicle of sex. Forget a grassy meadow under blue sky. Forget balmy breezes and birdsong. Forget how I compare thee to a summer's day. Imagine instead a wintry night in March. Water frozen in the wash basin. The castle so cold you want to pull the blanket over your lover and wolf around. The Elizabethan Ice Age was hell on pneumonia, but ideal for sex. She has no problem finding a uh, breath for her favorite fantasy. A royal progress arrives at a castle. A cloud of vapor hovers over the procession. The chattering, belching, farting throngs of lords and ladies in their entourage comes to a halt. Litter bearers set down their burdens. Lords and vassals alike be in the moat. Ladies in waiting form a protective screen around the queen. She glances up and sees Oxford shaking off his epistle. A golden mist arises from the road and, How do you like it so far? I, I stare at my notepad in disbelief. Did she actually say shaking off his epistle or did I make it up? <laughs> is being foreplaying? Where is she going with this? She fights through a paroxysm of impatience. All right, Mr. Smarty Pants, let's see you do better. That was our first session. <laughs> okay, so for three months I studied Edward De Beer. I knew nothing. I, I'd heard of the authorship debate, but I, I, I didn't know what, uh, what the facts were. And uh, in, in three months, you can't even learn it in three months. And she wanted me to have a, a first chapter written, so I had to scratch one out in a hurry because she was so she was really getting mad at me. Okay, let's get started, she says. Read your chapter to me. We're in her house on Lincoln Drive. I start to open my manila envelope. Not here. She disappears into her bedroom. Like Buck, Rod like Buck Rogers without the space helmet, I follow her into pink intergalactic space. She kicks off her slippers. She had pink decor in her walls of things. She kicks off her slippers, hops, his, hops into bed, and smooths the bedspread. Where is Jane? I say, trying not to panic. <laughs> Adjusting the bows of her white kimono, she stretches luxuriously. Jane's running errands, get into bed. <laughs> How about I read to you from the chair? I don't hear that you eat. <laughs> my patron crosses her arms. If you need help with sex, that's my department. <laughs> I'm afraid that the beer can't get it up. <laughs> At the same time, if he doesn't, she may come up with a lascivious inducement. I ease into bed beside her and lean back against the pillows. She grips my arms, my arm, as if accompanying me into the opening scene. And so, now I'm reading from this book, right? And it's in italics in this book. The unthinkable was happening. The master Harold had forgotten his name. He adjusted the stiff buckram vest, settled his rapier on his hip, 
and waited for the fool to recognize him. He had ridden night and day to Richmond Palace to report the Scottish defeat. It was the Scottish border war. To be denied entrance because of the doorman's faulty memory was a cruel twist of fate not to be borne. He muttered, say the Earl of Oxford. Why doesn't the Herald know who he is? It's foreshadowing he's a poet without a name. He's the senior goddamn girl of England. <laughs> he's 20 years old. He's dressed for combat. The doorman doesn't recognize him. Don't you see the humor? No. <laughs> Get Edward and Bess into bed? Or maybe start off with him in bed. I'm not sure I have the discipline for this work environment. <laughs> It helps to remember Dean's advice. Accommodate her if you can. Learn to get along. <laughs> this from a woman who knows me all too well. What do you have in mind? Something lascivious. <laughs> <laughs> that is our thing. Isn't it logical to have them meet at court and as they get acquainted, the reader learns about them? This is exposition. Let's see him in his element. A courtier kneeling before his sovereign to report an English victory. It mattered not that he had never drawn his sword in anger. He had observed a Scottish castle surrounded, a devastating cannonade, a white flag flashing on the parapets. A truce, a parley, tempers flaring, bombast, tossed like gauntlets. The siege resuming, more cannonade, another standoff. Fireballs launched in reply until the Scottish castle was on fire and the defenders out of order. Kabir sat his horse so long his legs went to sleep. What's she wearing? Hmm. They were big on decolletage back then. How do you spell that? <laughs> she kicks her feet in amusement. She really did die with and it took her a long time to get her to. If you wonder how I have this, have remembered all this in 1987, I actually started a diary and took notes because she was fascinating. And we got we got along great. I mean, maybe it sounds like we, we had problems, but only in the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> she kicks her feet in amusement. How do you spell that collage, right? <laughs> Exuding little old lady smells of perfume and something else. I haven't smelled talcum since I sat on my grandmother's bed. <coughs> She's wearing a red gown with pearls in her hair. She observes as if the meeting between the Queen and Earl is presently happening. Or maybe Tudor to, to, to Green with emeralds. Or a white gown and a diamond tiara. Yes, make the ground white, because no matter how many lovers she's had in her own mind, she's still a virgin. We don't need that. <laughs> Though he weighed less than ten stone, he entered the presence chamber with the heavy tread of a conquering hero, yet none of the lords and ladies paid him the slightest attention. Queen Elizabeth listened to one of her mates play the virginals. Plumed helmet under his arm, he knelt. How much is ten stone? <laughs> 140 pounds. Don't joke about his weight. A great man doesn't have to be physically imposing. Just don't let him be skinny. <laughs> With a wave of her fan, Elizabeth stopped the music. God be praised, this brave soldier, our Lord Oxford, has returned safely. He stared at the royal slippers. She had called him a soldier in front of the entire company. When he looked up, she was smiling, her red hair like a flame. He, he sprang to his feet. The Scots are vanquished, your grace. Lord Sussex is triumphant. The northern border is secure. The court burst into applause. Since boyhood, he had dreamed of military glory, practiced long hours with sword and crossbow. It did not matter that the border war had been a trifling affair. Castle, castle after castle sacked and burned or that the army spent nine-tenths of the time making, ar making and breaking camp. It's taking too long. <laughs> For what? To get them into this. <laughs> the readers aren't in that big a hurry, are they? All right, sum up the opening scene. The queen is bored. Nothing is happening at court. Everyone's standing around waiting for the banquet. Then Oxford arrives, arrives and everything changes. She is enchanted with this lively young Earl who improvises a play to entertain the court. Extempore, yes, out of his head, but what? Every minute they're not screwing is a waste of time. <laughs> this is an exact quote, I promise. Can't we build up to the sex? 
All right, damn it, what next? He improvises a pageant, divides, lowers and ladies into pairs, improvises props and costumes out of tablecloths and drapes and candelabras, and has them promenade to the music. He is playwright, director, and producer. He says, the courtship begins at the banquet. They banter, argue, spar, forget to eat. We're foreshadowing their combative relationship. Dessert was served by costume dancers from Arabia. Sugared wine, brandy dates, cheeses, cheeses and raisins soaked in honey. Oxford continued his battle report. Sussex's raiding party under Sir William Drury penetrated Scottish defenses nigh to Edinburgh. If I may say, Majesty, your knights wept at being denied the coup de grace. We had little choice but to break off hostilities, she said. Queen said, whilst you were setting butts of fire, the King of Scotland was appealing to the King of France for reinforcements. If France joined forces with Scotland, where would that leave us? Soldiers must fight, we must reign. Mrs. F is silent. What is she thinking? It's like waiting for thunder after lighting one Mississippi, two Mississippi. I hate foreshadowing. <laughs> what does that mean anyway? Get it on, excuse my French. Uh, again, a direct quote. Get it on, excuse my French. Okay, so here is the, this is the seduction scene we're in, we're getting into now. And it's, it's here, but I'm reading it from this book because I quoted in this book, right? The door to the Queen's apartment swung open. A serving girl cursing. Oxford followed her through ante-rooms, sitting rooms, bedrooms, privy chambers, and yet more ante-chambers leading to presence chambers and who do watch chambers? So many anti-rooms in so little time. If the last were willing, they might tarry for a rehearsal. The maid stopped before a door and knocked with authority. Gall even, he, he was not sure he could brought himself to do it. Wasn't this Her Majesty's retiring chamber? Hearing a summons, the maid opened the door and stood aside. He hesitated. She curtsied and gave him a little smile of encouragement. Sit you down, sir, called the queen. She wore a velvet dressing gown, her hair falling on her shoulders. See, I didn't say it was to her brain. <laughs> In soldierly fashion, fist against his hip, raking her angle behind him, he went forward, trying unsuccessfully to hide her amusement. She gestured at her wineskin and silver goblets. He poured the wine, grateful for something to do. Why is he grateful? He's ill at ease. Why? You said he was a virgin, remember? <laughs> yes. Dressed my shoulder, eyes wide with excitement. Yes, he's waiting for the right woman. Thank you for remembering that. <laughs> he set his goblet on the sideboard and unbuckled his belt, balancing sword and metal scattered against the wall. As he turned away, it fell to the floor with an ear shattering crash. He glanced at the door, half expecting a guard to come bursting in. Elizabeth had it to love suit. Just remember when we first met, she said. Hi, Majesty, at Hedingham Castle, I beat thee at Jus de la Malay. I was 11. Don't remind the reader of their age difference. Thanks, actually, she's thinking the same thing. She changes the subject and asks about his law studies. They bandy Latin back and forth. Latin in a sex scene? <laughs> Sparring for them is foreplay. French kissing and a rising cut piece is foreplay. Oh, my God. We need to show his literary interest. Oh, by the way, that was a direct quote, too. I didn't make that up. A rising conference. We need to show his literary interest. He plays hooky from Grace Inn to attend George Gascon's play, the supposes. Forget Gascon, get it on. <laughs> Did one wait for royal permission? He pressed his lips gently against Elizabeth's and was startled when she kissed him back. You spill wine in your lap. Her Majesty dabbed at his breeches. They dropped their cups and kissed hungrily. The love seat nearly tipped over. She laughed deep in her throat. I lie in this in heat. Add that. The lioness got it. In heat. <laughs> She at his clothing, unbuttoning, yanking, like a serving girl, 
strike that lioness in heat. She bent to pull off his boots, then shoved off his breeches, leaving him naked and erect. Being fully clothed, she grinned, enjoying her advantage. He dived into bed and watched her slip out of her gown, admiring the economy of motion. She slid under the bedclothes and laid a cool hand on his stomach. Am I the first? He tried to silence her with a kiss, but she held back. Am I? He slumped on the pillow and stared at the canopy. I wager some lusty maid had had thee, she said. Mrs. F. snatches the page from my hand. Having trouble finding breath, she shakes the paper, the sheet of paper until the words come. She wouldn't joke about this. He must be mindful of his seed. Her hands get busy. Excuse me? You know, busy hands. She touches him, grabs it. <laughs> he hesitated and felt her hand guiding him. She gripped his buttocks. Wait. Before he achieves penetration, she says, if thou art a virgin, so are we. Write that down before we forget. <laughs> this is one of the great experiences of my life. I don't know if you can tell that from my attitude, <laughs> but uh, this... Uh, Connection with Gertrude Ford is over 30 years ago. And it's just, it's like it was yesterday to me. And it will, it will always be that way for me, I think. And uh, I wasn't even going to publish this book, but I'm so <laughs> glad I did. When I was editing this book, getting all the quotes in mind, I, I would have to go back and check them against the manuscript. And I went, uh oh, this has got to be published too, because this reads pretty well. And it's tight. And Kathleen helped me tighten some of the. <coughs> I, had, uh, I had a tendency to digression. Anything that I thought was funny at the moment, no, you can't do that. As a writer, and she, uh, she's an uh, ex journalist, you know, New York Star Ledger bureau chief. And she uh, tutored me on that, for which I'm grateful. Anyway, I'm really happy to be here today. Of, of, bringing these two books out here where it belongs at Oxford Books. And I thank you all for coming in. I'll answer questions if you, if anybody uh, heard anything you, you, uh, you would like to explain. Jack, Jack? Yeah. Larry, have you ever thought about the similarity of your story to uh, Sunset Boulevard? Well, one of the early readers uh, said that it, it, it reminded him of uh, Sunset Boulevard. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't, I didn't uh, consciously do that. It just happened. But then another reader said it was Cohen Brothers. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was reading it and everything. I had to go back and watch Sunset Boulevard, and it just really fell into place, even down to <laughs> your, uh, William Holden is rewriting Norma Desmond's script for Salome and such as right. that. That's right. I never thought about that. This came strictly from my experience with Mrs. Ford. I'm not saying you copied oh, of it. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's one of those wonderful coincidences. Yeah. I, guess. Uh -huh. uh, I was going to ask how long did you work with Gertrude Ford on this? And I know you said you didn't get along at first, but when did it flip to where you're like, I love this woman. I love working with her on well, this book. Well, it was when I was in England and she was calling me on the telephone and having kids. And it would be about four o'clock in the morning for her. And Jane Stanley told me that she was staying up and drinking and smoking too much and it was bad for her health. And, uh, but I didn't know that until I got back. I, I, a lot of times when you it's 8 o'clock in the morning and you have somebody yelling at you on the phone when you just waked up, you don't really think about what time it is in Mississippi. But um, I, uh, I realized how much she knew and, and, and all of her, she didn't just read about Edward De Beer, she experienced it, she lived it. <clears throat> it was a, the moment that I, I had a turning point about her. John Maxwell, the uh, actor in Jackson, he did uh, Oh, Mr. Faulkner, can you write? Do you write? Uh, had been one of a troupe of actors that she flew to New York City, commercial, 
to put on the, her play that she had written, which was nothing but pull together quotes from Shakespeare's plays, which uh, you could interpret to understand that it was Edward the Beer. And so it was just one quote after another. It was, it was uh, they actually rewrote the play on the, on the plane. And I went to Theater Four, where that was that was that play was performed. Bill Dunlap had told me about this, and and sort of, and John Axel. and and I envisioned her sitting in her uh, sitting there in her mink coat, and all alone, with these actors, pretty much laughing their way through the through the rehearsal, and uh, it the word got out, and when they put on the play there at. Uh, Theater Thor, um, young Mississippians who were in New York working as waitresses and waiters who were the ones making on Broadway or uh, uh, writers uh, came to the came to the theater. They, were, they, they didn't take a collection because it was a, it was not a play that they were putting on. They just rented her the. Uh, the uh, theater, I think it cost 25 grand also to find them up there and put, put the play on in the 19, whenever it was, 70s, I guess. And that was when I felt a real sense of her, her sadness and her, uh, really her desperation to, to want to, 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 to not just to prove that Edward De Beer was Shakespeare, but to, uh, in a way, do something for her imaginary lover, because she was she was in love with Edward De Beer, and uh, so in the in the scene when I described that scene, when I went to the theater and it's empty, I just I, I have an imaginary Edward De Beer. He comes in and sits next to me. Anyway. <clears throat> that was that was the turning point for me in, in relation to uh, her and uh, realizing that we were in it together. Mm. Okay, John, take this I don't mean to ask for a spoiler, but how does this resolve? You know, we, we now know the difficulties of telling the story, and we know who this character is, uh, both the fictional and the and the true life character, and we know your role. Mm -hmm. So how does this resolve? The story of your intent, or you know, the thing you were hired to do. Yeah, I don't want to spoil it. Tell me what you can tell. Okay, here we go. Yeah. Uh, when I got back from England, uh, I didn't. I hadn't heard from Mrs. Ford in two or three weeks, and uh, I did find out from the university when I went in to turn my expenses um, that she had. She had uh, signed the agreement with OBS to, uh, to to give them you know, the money to, to build the Ford Center and more. And uh, basically, it was her entire estate. It was the income from her estate. And uh, and so I called Jane and said, uh, I haven't heard from her what, what's going on. And she said, she's had a, a series of strokes. And um, She's experiencing memory loss, and I want you to be very gentle with her when you come. And uh, I, I had written by that time. I had written the last chapter of the book, and um, so I read her the last chapter, John two, and the last chapter is when Elizabeth is dying and she sends for Edward to be and that really happened, and it's a great scene. And so that is just supposed against my reading to her in video. This is this last chapter. Mm -hmm. but thank you. So I hope you that you will uh, enjoy this and uh, remember you heard it here first. <laughs>